The revolution will be individualized. Today, my brother Kamal and I are going to talk about life lessons from the king, or as we say in Chicago, from the king. What's going on, brother Kamal? <laughs> The Kang. The Kang. The Kang. You know what? I should have used that clip from uh, Coming to America where the guys in the barber shop are talking. One dude's making up a story about how he met MLK. And uh, and one of the barbers responds like, oh, man, you ain't never met no Martin Luther the Kang. They kept calling him the Kang. <laughs> but uh, I figured that's probably too old school of a reference. <laughs> but we're talking about Martin Luther the Kang. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we've hit on, on, on a couple <clears throat> fundamental figures, uh, historical figures who've, who've really changed the way that we live today. Uh, I, you know, I was reading on Martin Luther King's, uh, his Wikipedia page, and he has hundreds of streets in the U S named after him. Um, and, and, and I think, when it comes to the kind of legacy, when it comes to the kind of impact, when it comes to, you know, how large of a, of a global, you know, impact he's made, I, I don't really think there's a lot of figures who come even close to him. Um, he, he is in an entirely different category in terms of how far and wide his message went and, and how he was able to implement change. And again, what we've said about him in the past is that when he was in the midst of really building what he was building, he was not seen as a super friendly or revered guy. Um, some communities he was there, there was, some, but there were also large portions of the population who did not see him in that light. And so it's just super interesting because I think, you know, he really was, he was deemed a revolutionary. He was deemed somebody who, um, you know, was trying to stir trouble, was trying to, you know, cause confrontation, was trying to, you know, undermine the systems at play. And I think he had um, a vision that that exceeded any kind of permission seeking life. Like he, he was really driven by a, a vision and a calling uh, that was bigger than him. I think that was bigger than the people who, who were in opposition to him and then were even was even bigger than the the people, the present people that he was serving. It, it was just such a grand calling. Um, and it was just cool to see somebody who who pursued that relentlessly, despite. I mean, despite everything. 100 percent, man, he, he's one of those interesting guys, too, because. Some people tend to be demonized when they die. And he kind of got a little bit more deified during his lifetime. Very controversial, considered to be very radical. And then history kind of got rewritten. The narrative kind of got reframed once he died. And, and a lot of that has to do with the, the martyrdom that, that tends to, um, the status of martyrdom that tends to get conferred upon those who are assassinated, especially when they were fighting for justice. But he, he kind of got boxed in by people in, into this category of a guy that was all smiles and all about peace and all about unity and everybody loved him and everybody was sad when he died. And, and, and he, he's sort of claimed by everyone today. When, when his national holiday comes up, it's like everybody has nice things to say about Dr. King. But that certainly was not characteristic of his life. Like anyone else, he had a lot of followers, a lot of supporters, a lot of people that he inspired. But he dealt with as much, if not more, smack talk, enmity, uh, unfair scrutiny and investigation, and physical attack. You know, he was ultimately assassinated, but that was not the first attempt on his life. I mean, that was even a, a moment where he was um, giving a talk and somebody ran up to him and stabbed him. And, it, it, you know, like he ended up going to the hospital, but surviving. But the way his life was is very different from the way we talk about his legacy. And, and he's also interesting, too, because he's one of those guys who you think about MLK, you think about the statement free at last, free at last. Thank God almighty, I'm free at last. And yet, because of his economic stances on certain things, he's not really considered 
much in Liberty spaces apart from being a guy that at least promoted peace. But even then, there's a lot of nervousness in talking about him because it's like, hey, but he was a communist, you know? And so I want us to talk about MLK in the spirit of everything that we're doing here um, with life lessons that we can learn from him for the purpose of living lives that are individually prosperous, individually free, and that can hopefully infect the lives of those around us to practice self-liberation, self-determination, self-reliance themselves. So there was this article that I really liked. There are tons of articles like this, by the way, but one of them is called 32 Interesting Things About Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it was by Insider. And you know, I'll, I'll make sure we, we post the link to it if you wanna check it out. But I decided to take um, six of my favorite things from that and we'll do three at a time. We'll do a part one and a part two, just like we did for Black Panthers last week and or, or or last time around and um we will um dive in take it one at a time you ready for this brother let's do it, let's do heck, it. Yeah. heck yeah heck yeah lesson number one his dream was born from personal heartbreak in the autobiography of martin luther king jr dr king recounted his first personal experience with racism and segregation as a child his white friends suddenly refused to play with him anymore, and he credited this portrayal as the moment he first became interested in fighting against racism. One of the things I want to highlight about this is when we talk about finding your calling in life, discovering and doing what makes you come alive, finding your passion, we usually emphasize the positive side of that. Well, what are the things you're curious about? Mm. What are the things mm. you're interested in? What are the things that make you feel really good? What are the things you enjoy so much that you would do them for free? And we spend all our space, we spend all our time in the space of thinking about those things that we don't want to do when, when mom yells at us and says, hey, it's time for dinner. Oh, mom, one more video game, one more basketball game, one more chapter of this book. We tend to limit our focus on passion or calling to those things. What I love about Dr. King's story is that it points out the value of pain when trying to figure out what you're born to do. Something that I've heard said before is that your anger is your biggest clue for the things that you were born to change. What fires you up in the way of frustration, in the way of sadness, in the way of anger? What are the things about the world that breaks your heart when you're trying to figure out what you're born to do, what you're optimized to change, don't neglect your pain and don't limit yourself by saying, well, I, well, TK, I don't know what my passion is. I don't know what I enjoy. Well, what do you hate? What really bothers you? What are those things you look at in the world and you can't be silent, silent about? What are the mistakes and failures that people make and it just costs you sleep? And when you complain about it to other people, they just don't really get it quite like you. Take a look at those things because those things might be clues for what you're here to do something about. It's not just about what positive things can I bring forth, but what are the negative things that make me feel like something is wrong with the world that I'm living in? There was an exercise that I discovered when I was doing a deep dive into personal development and, and really trying to figure out you know, what were some big life goals of mine? You know, what motivated me? What is my purpose? Really trying to understand a lot of these uh, big picture questions. And the exercise, it was essentially, I'll, we'll just call it the seven whys. And it was the exercise where you would ask yourself, like, why do you want to have this one thing? And then, you know, you would give yourself an answer. And then you would go one layer deeper. And he was like, well, why is that the case? And then you would go one layer deeper. Well, you know, why is that the answer that's informing that answer? And 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 after a couple layers, you know, you you get really down to the core. And what's interesting is that for me, you know, a lot of my goals came from the things that I wasn't provided in my childhood. You know, um, for, for one of my you know financial goals is, is 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 really to earn a lot of money, to like be a millionaire one day, and 
tracing that back, um, asking, asking why, after why, after why, you know, at, at first I would say something like, well, you know, I just want to have a lot of cool experiences. I don't want money to be, um, you know, a deterrent to that. Or then maybe a layer deeper, I would say, well, I don't want money to be a deterrent because uh, I've never had a lot of money. And then a layer deeper, you know, money, I have never had a lot of money because, you know, our family was always on a budget. And 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 once you really dig down deep into some of these layers, you kind of really, you, you start to uncover some of the underlying um, motivations for for why you're doing the things that you're doing or why your goals are the goals that they are. And what I've found in doing a couple of these is that a lot of those motivations, a lot of those things that, you know, subconsciously push me to go after certain goals come from things that happened in my childhood that weren't ideal or weren't the way that I wanted them to be. Um, and there's, it's, it's, it's actually a really good exercise. If you're looking to figure out, you know, what is the direction I'm trying to go? You know, what, what are the things that I'm looking to satisfy in my life? Looking back at your childhood, um, I mean, there, there's so much in our childhoods that really can help, you know, explain why we are the way that we are. You know, why, why do we have the convictions that we have? You know, why are we so motivated to, for this particular thing? You know, it's, we're not the same as everybody else. Why isn't somebody else as motivated? And a lot of times it goes back to childhood and goes back to those moments that you just never forget. You never forget when you come in, 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 contact with a confrontation and really challenges your values. And it just, it really hits you in your core and it makes you, you know, it makes you question what you've been told or what you've been taught. And you don't really know how to wrestle with it then and there as a child because you're not fully developed. You don't have the skills, but it does sit with you. And a lot of times, you know, some of the most powerful people, some of the most influential people have stories that trace back to their childhood that really, make them just so driven to, to 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 achieve whatever they're going after and and I think for anybody who's looking to do that who's looking to tap into you know their why or who's looking to you know find that that energy source that motivation source that is pulling them towards a certain goal you know go look into your childhood look look at some of the experiences that you had um, and see and if see if you can find a common thread that is trying to move you forward. Man, that's such a viable exercise in in so many directions too, because a lot of the decisions that we make today as adults are really choices we've made when we were six, seven, eight, nine years old. Choices about how we're gonna protect ourselves, how we'll react to that kind of adversity again. And so many of the things that we do today are just the living out of past choices that have never been revisited, never been challenged, never been upgraded. I once heard it said that adult problems are simply youth problems left unresolved. And so if you want to understand the conflicts that dominate your life right now, just go back to the choices that you made in childhood and take a look at some of those things. Uh, you know, another thing you mentioned reminds me of one of my favorite stories about a dishwasher who wasn't making a lot of money. He was new to, to the States. He didn't speak very good English, but he saw in the classified section of the paper some, um, some theater that was looking for actors. And because he didn't know anything about acting, he thought to himself, well, this can't be too hard. And so he went to the theater. He um, tried to audition, and he was so terrible that the director not only told him, no, thanks, you're not what we're looking for, but he actually snatched the script from his hand and said, don't waste my time. Go be a dishwasher or something. And mm. the man thought to himself as he walked out of that theater, how did he know? How did he know? Of all the things he could have called me, of all the insults he could have given to my name, he said, be a dishwasher. The very thing that I was doing for a living at that time. And I made up my mind that I would become an actor if for no other reason than to let that man know 
that that was more that there was more to Sidney Poitier's name than being a dishwasher. And the brother went on to become the first African American male to win the Academy Award for Best Actor in a Leading Role. And it's one of those moments where he didn't discover the theater by meditating and having a revelation saying, ah, this is what I'm born to do. He didn't have a positive experience that made him say, wow, I wanna do this for the rest of my life. The man was curious about something, but that curiosity led him to an experience that was negative, frustrating, heartbreaking. And he responded that to that in a way that says, you know what? This experience has taught me something about myself. And those are lessons that we can all get from our pain, the disappointments, the heartbreaks. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that Dr. King's life uh, teaches us. Let's go to number two. His legacy was grounded in work ethic. From an early age, Dr. King had an established paper route. His work ethic allowed him to be promoted and he became the youngest assistant manager for the Atlanta Journal delivery station at age 13. I said, I get this mixed up. I said paper route, it's paper route, right? <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce words, man. Yeah. Help me out. Yeah, it's paper route. Um, paper um, route. I'd be saying, I, I get I get tripped up on that. Get your kicks on Route 66. But if you're doing your paper route on Route 66, <laughs> just trying to work this out. <laughs> I'm going to do a, a tongue twister. Doing my paper route on Route 66. Okay. <laughs> His legacy was grounded in work ethic. I, I I love this one, man, because to know that the brother got his first job very young and he didn't just get a job. It was a, a, a relatively non-flattering job. There weren't a lot of jobs available for young black boys at that time. And he got what he could get. He took what he could get. But it wasn't just this thing of, yeah, Dr. King worked as a paper boy, too. It was he took his job seriously. He took his mm. job personally and took a lot of pride in his work and became the favorite. Like that that's a really yeah. hard yeah. thing to do, to work so hard, to work so well with so much character that you become your manager's favorite. And there's a there's a quote by him that's very popular and people quote it a lot where he talks about even like whatever you do, do it with pride, even if you are a street sweeper be like the best street sweeper that you can possibly be. And if you don't know the context behind that, you can think, oh man, that's just him talking about some cliche stuff that he must have read in the Tony Robbins book. No, he never read Tony Robbins. He came before Tony and it wasn't something that he got out of a book. It's something that he got out of his life. This is a man who was able to have an impact on people because he understood the people that he was seeking to impact. He never spoke to people from a place of not knowing what it was like to work hard and demonstrate character in his own life. And in this age of the striving to be an influencer, the striving to be a celebrity, the striving to get to be the one who is featured and has the spotlight, it can be so easy to forget that it, it's more important to focus on serving than on shining. And the only way you can be the kind of person who focuses on serving is if you learn how to serve others in your own life. You learn how to humble yourself and do hard work, even when that spotlight isn't shining on you. And that's something that I felt like he demonstrated in spades. He practiced what he preached in that regard. You know, what I think about is that it's really easy to look back at his legacy, at his career, and be in awe about how big of an impact he had, like how successful he was um, as a leader, as a civil rights activist, um, as a peacemaker, as a pastor, as, as all the things that he was. It's really easy to look back. And I think, you know, we, we intuitively know that there's something special about that. We know that, you know, not any old human being can do that, that it takes um, a special trait. But I think a lot of people place more uh, value and more 
um, they give more credit to this special trait, to this, you know, remarkable human being, this, you know, godlike figure uh, quality that these kind of people have. And they don't give or place a lot of uh, credit or, or value on the work ethic. Um, they, they just think that, you know, well, he was an anomaly or he was um, he was special. And I, I think I think both can be true. But I think people are missing the work ethic. I mean, to 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 leave a legacy, just generally speaking, like if, if you want to be remembered after you die and if you want to have an impact on uh, generations uh, to come, you got to work your butt off. Um, but but to leave this kind of legacy, a worldwide legacy, best believe the brother worked like relentlessly, like a workhorse. I th- and and what's. What's really uh, apparent about him as a leader was that he was next level when it came to organizing and collaborating and mobilizing people. I mean, he 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 would get I mean, you just got to think he would go to different towns in, in, in the United States and, and mobilize people to do a march. He didn't live in a lot of these places, but. And, and so, you know, people are meeting you for the first time and you're coordinating for the first time and and to fight a, to, to fight oppressive forces that are specifically coming from the government at that time. You you can't just do that unorganized. You can't just spontaneously say, hey, you know, let's pick up pitchforks and uh, torches and just hit the streets like it doesn't work that way. When the FBI has you on their uh, co- COINTEL Pro uh, their counterintelligence program that targets radicals. Um, you, you you don't get the courtesy of just you know being r- lax with your approach. It, it takes a lot of coordination and a lot of you know just really detail oriented moves, and and that that comes from somebody who is co- like constantly on, constantly always thinking, constantly always mobilizing, constantly always uh, networking, constantly always, you know, collaborating, anything that needed to be done, he was not above it. I, you know, you, you talk about people or bosses or leaders, you know, who are willing to take out the trash in their organization. I think that that's the kind of man that MLK was, that there, there was nothing above him if it needed to be done, that he was willing to put himself um, on that front line to make sure it happened, and and there's just so much power to be to be learned from a leader who's willing to do that, um, because you essentially enable your movement, you enable your followers, you enable um, whatever you're trying to do. You 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 set the example for people like no, that that this mission is more important than myself as, as one individual being. Um, and I think he, he was, it was just really impressive the way that he carried himself and he articulated it. And that, like you said, it, it, that is grounded in his work ethic. I love what you had to say about all of those things that he did, those dramatic things that we notice him for and how that was the product of the preparation that he had outside of the spotlight your ability to deliver in the big moments will be the result of the habits you cultivate in the little moments. You said it best in a previous episode where you said excellence is a transferable skill. When you think about mastery, it's not like a light in your room where you can just ignore it for days and days and days. And then when you're ready for some light, you flip on the switch. Excellence doesn't work like that. You can't hold yourself back for the big moments, the dramatic moments, the moments where the spotlight is on and expect to be able to show up if you're not practicing during the non-glamorous moments where there is no crowd. I think uh, Muhammad Ali was the one who said that champions aren't made in the gym. Uh, They're only recognized there, you know, or champions aren't made in the ring. They're only recognized there. You know, they're made in the empty gym. They're made in the crowdless weight room. They're made in the lonely nights where you are studying other boxers or whatever it is may be to make yourself better. And I, and I look at this. The, he was the youngest assistant manager for the Atlanta Journal Delivery Station at age 13. There are some jobs that I think are just harder for us to take seriously 
especially when we look at them as transition jobs or jobs that are not part of our calling or things that we don't even really care to be remembered for. When I worked in a grocery store uh, at age 16, I never at any moment thought to myself, this is what I want people to think about when I die. Like in my mind, I hope that nobody ever found out that I worked at a grocery store. I was ashamed of that job. I didn't, I didn't, I was 16 and he was already th only 13 and he got this, but I didn't get it at that time because I, I looked at it as, well, I'm going to show up here and do just enough to not get in trouble so that I can get my paycheck and go home. But I'm going to really save my best effort for the stuff that I want to be great at. And it's like, that's not the way to be great. You've got to cultivate excellence and mastery and a good attitude and good work ethic wherever you find yourself. Not because you think that the job you're at is worth your best effort, but because you are always worthy of your best effort. Your potential, your destiny, your future is always worthy of your best effort. And so you always want to give the best effort that you can muster in the place that you're in. And that's the thing that positions you to be able to really show up and make a big impact when something high is at stake. I also wanted to add on to this as well, because, you know, this, this whole notion of excellence is a transferable skill. And it's funny because you brought up that you worked in a grocery store. Is that true? Or, or were you just saying that for the sake of, uh, you know, Martin Luther King kind of illustrating the point? No, nah, man, I take great pride in the fact that I never have to make it up when it comes to all my odd jobs and crazy jobs. So the grocery store that I worked at in high school is uh, Jewel Osco. And um, Osco was the name of the pharmacy. But I worked uh, both as a uh, stock boy, uh, first as a shelf facer, where, you know, I just had to make sure everything on the shelves looked <laughs> yep. neat. And then after I gained a little trust, I worked as a stock boy. And occasionally I got a little time up at the register, also as a grocery bagger. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I, I too worked at a grocery store. Um, I was actually much later than both of you all uh, in, in my life. I was uh, 21, 22, 20, I think 23 was the last year that I was there. But I mean, this was that was a really tough time for me, uh, really embarrassing. And like you said, I, I didn't actually want people to know that I worked at a grocery store. I mean, all of my friends at that time, they were either uh, graduating college or they were starting like their first, you know, big boy, big girl jobs. And I was at a grocery store and I was facing shelves and I was, you know, mopping floors and. Uh, cleaning up spilled milk and broken eggs and helping people out to their cars, the whole nine yards. And I think starting off that job, I, I had a very similar approach where I was just like, you know, I'm just here to collect the check. Um, you know, we're, we're at a grocery store. This job isn't that serious. This isn't what I want to do with the rest of my life. Um, it's it's kind of whatever. Like, I'm just, I'm just here because I, I have bills that I need to pay and whatnot. And I, 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 I don't, I can't attribute the, the, the mindset switch to any particular thing, but I will say I, I, I just got tired of kind of dragging and I got tired of, of hating my job. And I got tired of, you know, just, just this kind of heavy, resentful feeling that you feel when you walk into work, you're just like, F like I, why am I here right now? Like I, I, I hate this. I don't feel like doing this. And I think that really comes through a mindset shift. Like all of us have stuff that we don't enjoy doing. Um, and there's two ways that you can approach it. There's the way that like, man, I have to do this. You know, this is some BS. Or you can approach it like this is what I get to do. Like I, I get to do this. I have the opportunity to show up um, and, you know, and, and, and make customers happy or, or whatever that looks like in your role. And so that, that was a mindset shift that I, I just embodied. And what, what's cool about really taking your responsibility, uh, you know, by the reins um, and just, and just really embracing the opportunity that you have in front of you is, is that it's, it's a momentum kind of game. Like the more that you do that, the more that you kind of get invested in in the job that you're working at or or, you know, for me, it was the grocery store that I was at and and really trying to be the best, you know, Trader Joe's Trader Joe's employee I could be. 
you know, having the best customer service or always making sure that I was going to get a raise or having good reviews, like just, just trying to be the best. Like what was cool was that I, I just built up so much life momentum. Like I felt really confident about where I was and I felt confident about my potential. I felt confident about, you know, what was going to be next for me. Like I didn't know for sure what was going to be. I didn't know which job. I didn't know which company. I didn't even know which industry I was going to get into. Um, but I felt really confident and I felt proud about myself for doing this kind of work. And so when that next opportunity did come, like I hit it, I hit the ground running and I was just on top of it. And, you know, when you get these little side jobs for Martin Luther King, it was, you know, it was a paper route at 13, but, you know, bringing that level of seriousness, bringing that level of dedication to that small job only gives you momentum and gives you confidence and, 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 and gives you, um, you know, some self value that, you know, like I I am what I bring to this world. I am, uh, the kind of person that I show up as, um, you know, I, I, I am this and I'm going to be this. And, and it just gives you this, you know, just infectious momentum, this productive momentum that you can really take and you can apply to the next activity. Like the skills, that I had in my next job, you know, me stocking the shelves at Trader Joe's didn't transfer to my next job, but the attitude did transfer, you know, uh, the camaraderie did transfer, you know, my, my, my mindset and that work ethic did transfer. Um, and so, you know, just focus on that, right. Just focus on, uh, the momentum and focus on getting yourself, uh, in a place where, you know, you're, you're developing things that do transfer, even if you're in a job that seems like it won't. You know, the funny thing about that is I can honestly say that I have never worked a job with pride without being offered jobs from customers who would come in. That never happened mm -hmm. at the grocery store because I, I hadn't learned to take pride in my job yet. But once I got to a point where I, I started to look at my work as a reflection of my character and I started asking myself, well, who de who defines the role, me or the person that wrote the job description? It's me. The person that wrote the job description just defines what is needed. But I'm the one that brings mm. the personality and the style and the spirit to the work. It's kind of like in theater, a screenwriter can write the words that need to be said, but it's the actor that makes those words lift off the page and come to life and take the form of an actual three-dimensional person. And it's the same day, it's the same way with a job. Like the job description does not make the job. It's the person who comes in and plays the role with pride, with style, with character, with creativity that makes the job. And whenever I approach my work like that, I've had multiple customers come in and ask me, like, what do you do? What do you want to do? And they try to poach me, you know, and I think that can be healthy to kind of measure yourself in that way sometimes to like strive to even achieve that as a goal, not because you're always looking for the next opportunity because but because it's a reminder that your destiny is never limited to your job description. It's always determined by the quality of character that you choose to bring to the work. And that's something that we all need to find out for ourselves. Sometimes it makes me sad when I hear young people almost on the verge of tears, feeling like they've reached rock bottom when they say things like, but I don't wanna flip burgers. And my first thought is, oh no. I hope however you treat people who are serving you when you order a burger, it's coming from a higher place than that. That's the first thing, you know, it, you know, because you telling me what you think about yourself, if you have to bag groceries and flip burgers, also provides me with some indication of what you think of the other people who do that for a living. And if you're ever going to be leading those people one day, you might want to rework the way you think about a human being who makes their living by flipping burgers or bagging groceries. That's the first thing, because you want to lead from a place of being able to empathize with people and being able to respect them for what they do. And there is no shame in doing what you got to do to provide for you and your family. But the second reason it makes me sad when people are like, oh, no, I don't, I don't want to bag groceries. I don't want to flip burgers is because it, it, it comes from a place of feeling like I'm going to get stuck doing something 
that is beneath me when I know that my potential is to go higher. But if your potential is to go higher, there is no job that will ever be able to contain you if you are committed to your personal growth. You will outgrow that job faster than you think is possible if you are committed to excellence in whatever you do. And once that big opportunity does come along, you will be ready because you won't need to pull yourself together in order to in order to, you know, deliver at the big moment. You'll have used all of the little moments to become a seasoned, experienced person who shows up consistently because they just respect the craft of being who they are, you know? Yeah. What I also know to be true, and I'm sure that you could echo truth on this as well, is that when you work in those kind of environments where it's very easy to just be like, ah, oh, this work is pointless. Ah, oh, I hate this job. Ah, oh, I hate the customers that come. Like, why do we have to do this? When you work in an environment like that, I think anybody who has know that knows that like the common uh, culture or the common you know perception of the employees is that is is that to hate the job is that to resent being here is that um, to be negative about the whole experience and 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 just to have this kind of stank attitude about you know whatever you're gonna do and I think you know th this is really where it it comes to your individualness like are you able to stand out um in a crowd of people who don't view you know a similar experience the same way as you i mean i promise you like when i started working hard and i started actually having some pride and and getting a little pep to my step there were like coworkers of mine who were like what the is this guy doing you know, like, why are you trying to like do that? Why are you trying to be like a goody two shoes? Like, why are you trying so hard now? Like, what's changing you? Why are you acting different? And I think like if you're somebody who uh, really n needs that validation or 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 considers, you know, your employee, your coworkers, or you know, whatever group that you're a part of at the moment, um, if if you're somebody who you know, places so much stake in that, then you're often going to lose your ability uh, to make those important changes, to make those mindset changes and to lean into your uh, own personal character and your own values. You're not going to be able to be grounded in your individual work ethic because the whole is trying to not get you to do that. They're, they're feeling uncomfortable with you trying to do all this and that. And what I know to be super true is that at 13 years old, being an assistant manager, I'm sure he got grilled. I mean, he probably got it. He got it bad. Um, you know, anybody who who works for an organization and a 13 year old comes along and he's rising the ranks and he's out working like you're going to do everything in your power to kind of belittle him or to bully him or to like, you know, intimidate him. And I think, you know, there there's that's a just a, a really powerful uh, testament to, to being able to stand in opposition comfortably, comfortably, because anybody can stand in opposition. But I think the 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 more you get used to that at, at a younger age and in, in, in situations where the stakes aren't that high, I mean, it's just a job, you know, we're just delivering papers, but there's always going to be opposition when you dare to be different. When you, you know, dare to take yourself seriously, when you dare uh, to try to realize the best version of yourself, there's always going to be people who have something to say. There's always going to be some kind of opposition. So if you if you can get in the habit of doing just doing that and being OK with that and you do it in spaces where the stakes aren't that high. You know, when you get to moments when the stakes are really high, where, where you're marching um, and you're standing up for civil rights and you're getting spit at, you're getting shot at, you're getting rocks thrown at you. You're getting punched, you're getting kicked, you're getting dogs sent after you. Like that's when the stakes are really high. But if if you you've already cultivated uh, you know, that inner power, that inner uh belief to be able to stand your ground, you know, stand in what you believe in, you know, that does transfer. You know, you're gonna be able to take that with you. One little success principle I'll say that I'm getting out of what you're saying is that whatever your ultimate form of success is, it's not just the product of the lessons you learn from failure along the way, 
but it's also the cumulative effect of the little successes that you create along the way. We talk a lot about that one time where you fell on your face and embarrassed yourself and how that can make you wiser and put you in a position so that you can be better next time. But there are also the little successes, taking your newspaper job seriously, taking your grocery store job seriously, learning how to get along with people that you don't like at that restaurant job, learning how to show up on time at that job that doesn't really pay you a lot, learning how to be patient with your customers when you're not in a position of leadership where a lot is expected of you. Those little moments of just being successful. I remember I worked at this restaurant and my manager was hardcore. My manager was so hardcore and super strict on everything. And I used to come into work scared. I used to be super scared because this manager called you out on everything. And I never enjoyed being there. And I remember one day I got up and I said, man, I do not like this state of mind. I'm going to take charge of my mind. I refuse to be walking around my work scared ever again. Mm. And so I had this little affirmation I will say to myself. Um, you know, in the <laughs> restaurant, they called being in the weeds whenever you just had a whole mm -hmm. lot of stuff going on. And the whole time when I'd be walking around, I'd be saying to myself, being in the weeds is a state of mind that I refuse to know. Being in the weeds is a state of mind I refuse to know. And when she would, she would call my name, maybe to correct me on something, I would look at her and in my mind I would say, I love working for you. I can handle everything that you're about to bring to me right now because being in the weeds is a state of mind I refuse to know. And I would say, what's up? <laughs> and man, I, I conquered that at that job. Nobody knows about that, but I conquered that at that job. And it's like, that was a little win that later on in life would pay off in a big way when I had bigger yeah. responsibilities yeah. and bigger challenges, that ability to take charge of my mind. And so those little things that you endeavor to master at the small jobs that aren't necessarily about your legacy may be more relevant to your legacy than you realize. Mm. Mm. Definitely. Let's hit Definitely. up number three, man. Let's get it. Let's get it. His faith was challenged by moments of doubt. Although he would later become a religious leader as a teenager, Dr. King had a very different view of his faith. In his autobiography, he wrote that he wasn't afraid to openly question everything he had been taught, even when it got him into trouble. At the age of 13, I shocked my Sunday school class by denying the bodily resurrection of Jesus, he wrote. Doubts began to spring forth unrelentingly. For anybody who thinks questioning your faith is just a personal thing, just something that only affects you and maybe the anxiety or sleeplessness you feel, you're somebody that did not grow up in church. Because if you think the world is rough on your beliefs, if you think the YouTube comment section is rough on anything you say that may not be right or doctrinally sound, you ain't grow up in the church. Because Christians don't play. Church folks don't play. There is no shortage of videos you can go find on YouTube where preachers are calling out other preachers by name. I mean, I, you, you don't even see this much in a rap industry. You know, <laughs> and I'm just describing. I'm not even evaluating. But you can find so many videos of pastors calling out other pastors by name. This person is a heretic. This person is wrong. And so... Having moments of doubt and expressing those doubts out loud, even if you're not a religious leader, even if you're just a church attendee and you have brothers and sisters in the faith who know you and like you, that's a socially risky thing. It makes people worry about you. It makes people wonder about you. It makes people question your legitimacy, question your sincerity. And in this generation, I don't think we do a very good job at making a distinction between a person being flawed and a person being a fraud. We tend to conflate those two things. We're all, we're, all, we're all flawed, we're all imperfect. But a fraud is somebody who deliberately deceives. And we tend to treat people when they are flawed as if they woke up in the morning and decided that they were gonna deliberately act out those flaws for the sake of taking everybody off and manipulating society. And so when people exhibit these flaws in their beliefs and in their behavior, we can be very hard on them. Now take that and imagine this brother is a religious leader. He has more influence on the beliefs of his congregation 
than the average person who just attends a church. To ask questions, to be honest about your doubts is one of the noblest things that you can do. But to do so in an environment where you are expected to toe the line, where you are expected to recite the creed, where you are respected to represent the faith is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And while I will not vouch for every aspect of his theology, and while I won't identify with every question that he asked or every doubt that he had, I know that in my own life, I have my own battles with doubt. I have my own moments where I may question myself, I may question my faith, I may question the people around me, and I have never been able to move in a positive direction by just pretending like those things don't exist and by saying, oh, uh, what's expected of me? What's my brand? I better say the things that line up with that. It's only when I'm able to find my brothers that I can get together with and say, hey, I'm having questions or doubts. It's only a way where it's only when I can say, hey, I'm wrestling. I'm wrestling with this right now. I'm processing this right now. I'm praying about it. I don't know where I stand that good things can happen. And so I think what we have in Dr. King is a really great example of what the right relationship to faith should look like. Not so much in terms of listing out his theological beliefs and saying, this is the right example of faith. This is the right example of faith, but more about the right way to hold faith. That faith is the combination of sincere belief plus the willingness to grow through questioning and the honest expression mm -hmm. of doubt. You know, I, I, I actually kind of want to ask a question here because what I know at least what I've heard about, you know, Dr. King and, and, and because he was such a, he was viewed as such a religious figure. I think, you know, a lot of folks used that as almost like a point of attack. Like, you know, aren't, aren't you supposed to be like a good Christian man? Like, why are you causing all of your congregation to go through all this? Why are you putting them through this hell? Why are you, you know, exposing them uh, to th these kinds of evils and this kind of danger, you know, why, why are you asking people to sacrifice their well-being uh, for you? And, 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 you know, a lot of it was used to frame him as somebody who was selfish or somebody who, you know, was manipulative. Um, and so, you know, how, how have, if you have, how have you navigated it when people, you know, use a faith that you identify with as, you know, means to, maybe discredit you or to question your loyalty to the faith or, you know, um, try to use your, you know, your faith to expose some of the things that uh, they feel is not the most accurate version of that faith. I think about that moment in the Matrix part two, where Commander Locke is arguing with Morpheus and he says, Morpheus, not everyone believes as you believe. And Morpheus says, fortunately, my beliefs do not require them to. Part of my faith includes understanding that there will be people who reject my faith. And whatever your beliefs are about any matter, your beliefs need to be big enough to account for the fact that not everyone will believe as you believe. Power doesn't come from getting everyone to agree with you. Power comes from being able to stand up for your convictions in spite of the fact that some people never will agree with you. And all too often, we limit our concept of power and social change to the realm of argumentation. I'm going to change the way you see things. I'm going to reason with you. I'm going to argue with you. I'm going to provide you with evidence. And some people just don't see it your way. Some people just don't want to see it your way. Some people just don't like you and they won't accept anything that comes out of your mouth because of judgments that they've made about you. Some people have too many insecurities or issues going on. Some people don't have the time or willingness to even let you make that argument while they sit around and listen. There are all sorts of factors going on in terms of your effectiveness or lack thereof with persuading people. But that's not the only form of power. We have the ability to act on our faith in a way that transforms the world, even while the non-believers and the haters and the doubters mock us from the sidelines. And I think that's something that Dr. King embodied well. 
when you see the footage of the dogs, when you see uh, uh, or you read the letter from, Bur the, uh, from Birmingham jail, this is a man who understood that the world around him was continuously questioning, mocking, or rejecting his convictions. And he wasn't doing what he did because he had social consensus. He was doing what he did because he had spiritual conviction. And so there mm. is a virtue in not being too shocked by rejection and persecution. One of the reasons why I encourage young people to put their ideas out there and, and, and to leave the comment section and join the creator section is because only when you join the creator section do you get a chance to develop the kind of maturity and inner substance that comes from other people critiquing you, misunderstanding you, ignoring you, laughing at you, saying I disagree, saying I think you're wrong, saying I don't think you said it well, and so on. And I think that's a necessary rite of passage not only into adulthood, but into leadership, into maturity. You just can't be too shocked by rejection and disagreement. You know, there's something that I wanted to share that you actually just shared with me yesterday. <laughs> um, and it went something along the lines of there's a fine line between insanity and genius. Um, that if you are somebody who, you know, who really just has a belief that that is just so internalized and so deep that a lot of times you're willing to go to the ends of the earth to fight for it that you know you're willing to pursue um this calling amongst all odds amongst all doubts amongst you know whatever kind of criticism and uh deterrence are are brought your way i think it's easy to look at uh, MLK's legacy and call him a genius after the fact. Um, but for decades of that journey, he was labeled as insane. This man is insane. He is crazy. He is out of his freaking mind. Um, and I think that that is just such that is that that's such a reality that all of us, I think in, like all of us for, you know, people who who have beliefs that are that are powerful, that are that are scary, that shake the table. You know, the, the, if you have a belief that's like that, I think there's a certain level of preparedness that you need to have to 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 approach that, to realize that, to to dedicate your life to it. Uh, and it's 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 freaking scary, you know, to to know that you're going to be labeled as this insane person, that you're going to be uh, that they're going to try to oust you, that they're going to try to um, you know do whatever they can to discredit you or, or just not take you serious or, or whatever the case may be. But there's just such a fine line between that insanity and the genius. Um, and, and it's, it's, that's the case because people can't, other people can't see that vision. They can't see what you see. And it's the, 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 the mission, the message, you know, that, that calling is given to you for a reason because you have the vision, you get to see it, you know what to look for and you know uh, where it can go if it's fully realized. And, and it's just one of those things that I think takes courage, just, just a tremendous amount of courage uh, to lean into that, to lean into despite what other people's labels are, whether that's insane or genius, like I know truth and I'm, I'm going as far as I can go with this truth. Um, and I think, you know, for some of the figures we've talked about, like Malcolm X um, or other figures, you know, it's society who ends up being the one who labels you insane or genius. But if you're committed to truth, I think truth is the thing that's going to set you free. Um, and, and it's going to bring you above everybody else's uh, opinions. This is, this is partly why I take issue with the, uh, be on the right side of history idea. A lot of people use that phrase. I'm doing this because I want to be on the right side of history. Or you need to make a choice right now to be on the right side of history. And I get the cement, the sentiment well enough to charitably interpret it. I get it. They're usually using that phrase as a synonym for doing what is morally right. Do the right thing. But I prefer just sticking with do the right thing. Because when you use that phrase, be on the right side of history, 
it creates the illusion that you actually have the ability to come close to predicting what the right side of history will be. History is about the past, not about the present. And when you are trying to make choices that will put you on the right side of history, that means you are acting in the present while making a prediction about people who will come along in the future and how they will interpret what you are doing in the present in light of the values that they have, in light of the interests that they have, in light of the culture that they are a part of. And if there's anything that's obvious, you look at the world today, every generation has things about them that causes them to look at previous generations and say, you know what? I don't think that person was all that. You know what? I don't think they were virtuous. And, and I actually don't like the way y'all let that person get away with saying this or doing that. And we can't always predict that because part of being wrong is not knowing that you're wrong. Part of being uh, susceptible to the cultural influences of your day is that you don't see those things as the cultural influences of your day. You just see it as the reality in which you live. And so you can't know for sure if you're going to be on the right side of history. You can do the right thing. That part you can control. But future generations, depending on who's in power and so on, they might come along and say, yeah, that guy, everything he said was idiotic. Everything he did was wrong. And you want to be the kind of person who goes to your grave with the kind of conviction that says, regardless of what they say about me when I'm gone, regardless of how the next generation defines virtue and vice, if they choose to look back on my generation and say, this guy was a complete idiot, I lived as I believe, I stood for the truth, I spoke my convictions, and I acted consistently with those convictions. I just want to be on the side of truth. And history, that'll take care of itself. And ultimately, God will take care of the historians. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Hey man, um, I think we can we can take a pause right here. I've got three more that I want to go through. We can treat this as our warm up, and we can come back next week for part two. Um, but you can close out, man. I give you the last word. Well, well, thank you. Um, you know, I I I, I would just say like a, as we're we've really been talking about um, a lot of these revolutionary figures. Uh, a, a lot of these people who were in opposition with popular opinion, um, it, it's really just given me confidence uh, to lean into the things that I care about um, as an individual and and to be OK with. I guess just with not being accepted, you know, being OK with, um, you know, pursuing my convictions, because I, I, I think you know, th this pursuit to truth is is not an easy journey, but I think it makes a life well fulfilled. Um, it makes it makes life worth living and it, it, it makes, you know, you coming uh, to the fullest version of yourself and, and, and it just makes life exciting. I think, you know, it's easy to go to work and, you know, to clock in, clock out, go home, watch TV and re rinse and repeat, you know, uh, go to the go to the park on a Saturday and, you know, just kind of live comfortably and uh, frictionlessly and, and just to spend the years of your life that way. I think it's easy. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think about like how special it is to have life, you know, the odds that we had to go through, you know, the, the mathematical odds for us as people to be here on this earth uh, is, is pretty astounding. You know, it, it's, and, and I think like I view life as an opportunity. Uh, I, I, I view it as uh, a journey. Uh, and, and it's exciting to me that that like I, I'm daring to do something that is different. I'm daring to lean into my individual convictions. And, and I think that's kind of what, what this whole thing is about. You know, a lot of these figures, the reason why they have legacies, the reason uh, why we're even talking about them is because like their commitment to truth was relentless. You know, sometimes it went against their religion. Sometimes it went against their loved ones. Sometimes it went against, you know, <laughs> all the things that make life comfortable. It, it went against that. Um, but those truths that they 
commit committed their lives to realizing were the truths that move the world forward, that move things forward, that move, um, you know, the human race forward. And, and I think, you know, that's what I want to be a part of that. That's the kind of company, uh, and, and the kind of creativity that I hope to, to bring, you know, it, it's something that moves things forward. Um, and I think, there's a lot of different ways that people go about that journey. Um, what we talk about is the way that you can do that for you, that, that you can mobilize that um, internally, that you can mobilize and, ha- and how that internal mobilization will then um, take change. And I think, you know, it, it really does start with your individual values. It really does start with those individual decisions um, and just that commitment to truth, man. It, it is it's such a liberating experience. And, it, and it's something that I don't think any one of these figures, and I don't think anybody listening will ever regret. If you commit your life to pursuing that, it's 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 something that only will make your life fuller, um, freer, um, and, and, and just more powerful. Well said, my brother. Well said. Prioritize the hero's journey, not the hero. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Hit the like button, please. Hit the subscribe button, please. Leave a question or a comment letting us know if there's anything you'd like to hear us talk about or any thoughts, feedback you want to give to us. And don't hesitate to share with a family member or a friend that you think might enjoy these conversations. All right, everybody, till next time, be sure to keep individualizing the revolution in your own way. Peace.